The Mandaeans are an ethno-religious people group that some scholars argue is the only Gnostic sect to survive since antiquity. Their own name might preserve this ancient connection with Gnosticism. Mandaean seems to derive from the Aramaic word manda, meaning knowledge. So just like how Gnostic derives from the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis, the Mandaeans self-identify as Gnostics, or people of knowledge. In this video we'll discuss major elements in Mandaeism, including the veneration of John the Baptist as an important prophet, and weekly baptism as a central ritual. However, Mandaeism is an endangered religion. Low estimates put their number at 40,000 adherents worldwide, with high estimates around 100,000 people. For most of their history, Mandaeans lived in the regions of southern Iraq and southwestern Iran, but following the Iranian Revolution in the 70s and the wars in Iraq throughout the 90s and 2000s, most Mandaeans fled their homelands and now live in diaspora communities around the world. I will structure this introduction kinda like my Yazidism video, organized around Mandaean beliefs, religious behaviors, and communal belonging. That is to say, how Mandaeans conceptualize their identity as part of a broader historical tradition. All video footage of Mandaeans is used with permission from the University of Exeter. Check out their project, The World of Mandaean Priests, here. Let's get into it. Mandaeism is a monotheistic religion, though according to Mandaean theology, this one god is better described as a transcendent entity or supreme power called the Great Life. This entity has other names like the Lord of Greatness, the King of Light, or the Great Mind. God in this sense is relatively impersonal, inhabiting a separate reality from our own material world. Mandaean cosmology understands the universe as divided into three tiers, a heavenly light world, an earthly world inhabited by humans and all of material reality, and a lower dark world. The light world is ruled by the great life. The light world is also the home of sacred angel-like beings called Uthri, who praise and perform rites for the great life. The dark world as the name suggests, is a gloomy place. It's ruled by Ruha, the mother of darkness, and her son Ur, a giant monster. Ruha is the embodiment of evil and stands in direct opposition to the light world. According to their sacred texts, the children of darkness populate the dark world, and they can take many different forms, like demons and fallen angels. The seven planets and the twelve signs of the zodiac are conceptualized as actual evil beings, offspring of darkness that inhabit the dark world as well. With all this talk about dark and light, we can see that dualism runs through Mandaean cosmology. The world comes into existence through a struggle between the light world and the dark world. Patahil, an emanation from the great life, is basically a demiurge, a lower cosmic being who created the material world as well as the body of the first man, Adam. But Adam's animating soul, his essence, originates from the light world. Thus, humanity itself has a dual nature of lower mundane matter versus a divine soul. The Mandaeans trace their mythological history back to Adam, who they believe is the first in a long line of prophets. Some of these prophets are unique to Mandaeism. Others you might recognize from Jewish and Christian mythology, like Noah and Moses, with the most important prophet being John the Baptist. Now, we don't know the exact origins of Mandaeism, but the Mandaeans themselves, as well as some scholars, claim that they originate from the Jordan Valley as followers of John the Baptist and migrated to southern Mesopotamia in the first few centuries CE. The scholar of Gnosticism, April DeConnick, reconstructs their history as either a sect of Judaism or a sect of early Christians living in the Jordan Valley. She argues that they left the region in the first century CE, possibly as refugees following the Jewish war, and eventually settling in Mesopotamia. This is the basic outline of their legendary origins as described in the Mandaean text, the Haran Gawaita, which says that a group of people called the Nazareans settled in the Sassanid Empire after fleeing persecution in Jerusalem. Other modern scholars argue against the historicity of their Jordan Valley origins, arguing that the grand narrative of a Mandaean exodus out of Jerusalem, as described in the Haran Gawaita, is just legendary, and they suggest that the Mandaeans originated from some sort of Gnostic group in southern Mesopotamia in the 2nd or 3rd centuries CE, again, possibly as a Jewish or Christian sect. Ultimately, we don't know their exact origins, but the earliest archaeological evidence of the Mandaeans emerges from late antique southern Mesopotamia. First, the Mandaic language is related to other ancient languages of that area. Although modern Mandaeans typically speak Arabic or Farsi, depending on where they're from, Iraq or Iran, 
they historically spoke an Eastern Aramaic dialect called Mandaic, which is related to Jewish Babylonian Aramaic, the language of the Babylonian Talmud. A modern version of Mandaic is still used in their liturgies today, and Mandaean scriptures are usually written in Mandaic. The Mandaic alphabet appears to derive from other ancient scripts from late antiquity, like Palmyrene and Nabataean scripts that were used by ancient peoples in what is now Syria and Jordan. We also have archaeological evidence that I find extremely cool. A collection of Mandaic incantation bowls. These bowls date to the 5th to 8th century CE, and they generally contain Mandaic magical formulas against demons and other evil spirits. Almost like writing an exorcism spell in your cookware to expel a demon from your house. They also explicitly use some of the same formulas that appear in later Mandaean scriptures. For example, five different incantation bowls seem to reference a story in the Mandaean scriptures when a bunch of demons created a big noisy racket that awakens Adam. I won't quote the two passages, but here they are on screen if you want to pause it. This is a big deal because the earliest manuscripts for Mandaean scriptures date to the 1500s, so hundreds and hundreds of years after they were probably first composed. So these Mandaic incantation bowls might be an early archaeological witness to Mandaean sacred scriptures. Today, their Arabic-speaking neighbors in the Middle East refer to them as suba, or baptizers, because of the centrality of baptism to Mandaeans. And Mandaeans sometimes refer to themselves as Sabians, claiming to be the same mysterious people group that the Quran mentions on several occasions, alongside Jews and Christians as people of the book. And in fact, according to Mandaean sacred stories, a Mandaean delegation presented itself to Muslim authorities in the early years of Islam. They emphasized their devotion to John the Baptist and showed the Muslim rulers the Ginza, the most important Mandaean sacred texts, in order to request recognition as a people of the book. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about their sacred texts, what are they specifically? Well, the Mandaeans have a bunch of sacred texts, but the most important one is the Ginza Rabbah, which means the great treasure, and it's sometimes shortened to just the Ginza. The Ginza is a compilation of several different texts written in Mandaic that include creation stories, moral lessons, mythological history, as well as prophecies about the end of the world. Mandaeans consider it to be written by the first man, Adam, though scholars think parts of it may date back to the second or third centuries and was compiled by the mid-seventh century. It has two parts, the left and the right Ginza. The left Ginza's three books are largely poetic and discuss a soul's journey to the light world, while the right Ginza has 18 books that discuss more nitty-gritty matters of creation, morality, and theology. What you're looking at is a facsimile of the Ginza provided by the scholar of religion, James McGrath. And you should really check out his blog here because he's an awesome scholar of religious studies and who doesn't need more really good religious studies scholarship in their life. The left Ginza is printed on one side of the book while the right Ginza is written on the flip side upside down. So you have to flip it all over to switch from reading the left to the right Ginza. Even to this day, the Ginza is usually handwritten, but printed copies are available. But the first printed copy was published in the late 1990s by an Australian Mandaean group. The second most important book behind the Ginza is probably the Mandaean Book of John, which Mandaeans believe to be written by John the Baptist. For those of you familiar with the New Testament, you'll already know that John the Baptist first appears in the Gospel of Mark as a Jewish preacher who announced the imminent arrival of Jesus as the Messiah. The Gospel of Mark says that John lived in the Judean desert and regularly baptized Jews in the Jordan River. The Jewish historian Josephus also mentions John the Baptist, calling him a baptizer with a great deal of influence over the people. However, Mandaean literature reconceptualizes John the Baptist. He comes from the light world and was miraculously sent into the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. In the Jordan Valley, he teaches the Mandaeans how to baptize and how to avoid impurity. Their veneration of John the Baptist initially confused European missionaries. Portuguese missionaries in the 1500s misidentified them as Christians of St. John, but Mandaeans consider John the Baptist as a renewer of their tradition, the final prophet in a long line of prophets, not a founder of their tradition. The Mandaean Book of John also hints at historical tensions with other religions of the region, specifically Christianity and Judaism. Parts of the book try to discredit both of these traditions. Mandaeans believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was was Mandaean and became pregnant by witchcraft or some other source other than her husband. The book portrays her son, Jesus, as a deceiver who abandons his Mandaean heritage. Ruha, the mother of darkness, is sometimes called the Holy Spirit, a possible dig against the Christian Holy Spirit. 
The Book of John also refers to the Jewish God as Adonai, and characterizes him as an evil figure, and his book, the Torah, as a book of falsehoods. All of this might point to historical tensions between Jews and Mandaeans. I'm including a link in the description below to an open source English translation of the Mandaean Book of John if you'd like to read more for yourself. Okay, so what makes the Mandaeans Gnostic? Remember from my other videos on Gnosticism that we shouldn't think of Gnosticism as a specific religion in antiquity. Yes, there were certain people who called themselves Gnostics, but there wasn't a church of Gnosticism in the sense of a social group with specific rituals and a cohesive set of beliefs. Scholars of late antique Mediterranean religion, like Karen King, have argued that we should stop using the term entirely because it's an invented modern category a term that basically became synonymous with Christian heresy. Other scholars like April DeConnick still use Gnosticism as a loose category that encompasses religious groups that share a few characteristics. These are groups that emphasize, first of all, the acquisition of gnosis, or knowledge, specifically direct knowledge of a transcendent god. Secondly, groups that characterize this god as a more impersonal entity or reality living in a transcendent realm separated from the material world. These groups also often emphasize the idea that humans possess inner divinity and are thus alienated from their true origins and destination by being stuck in this material realm. Using this category, scholars lump a bunch of different groups under the umbrella term Gnosticism, such as Valentinians, Sethians, Manichaeans, and Mandaeans. The Mandaeans share a lot of similarities to so-called Gnostic texts from late antiquity. So, for example, the Mandaeans' transcendent god is similar to what we see in Valentinian Christianity, which flourished in the first few centuries CE. Mandaeism similarly argues that humans have a dual nature, a divine soul that belongs to another, higher, brighter realm, and a mundane physical body that restricts their true essence. The soul is virtually trapped in the material world like a prison, and it yearns to return to the world of light. They also similarly argue that the material world was created by a demiurge, a lower being and emanation of the great life. So, it seems that Mandaeism emerged from the same stream of Gnostic thought that was so popular during the late antique period. Okay. So that was a summary of Mandaean belief in historical origins. But what about religious practice? Mandaean ritual revolves around maintaining purity, and in a cosmological sense, avoiding pollution from the dark world. Because the surface of the earth is extremely close to the dark world, humans are in constant risk of pollution and must be purified ritually with water. For example, objects must be purified in running water before being used in rituals. Baptism is a central ritual to Mandaean practice. Unlike Christian baptism, which is typically a one-time initiation into the faith, Mandaeans perform baptism every Sunday, and traditionally in flowing water, which they call Yardina, or Jordan. Flowing water is considered to be a manifestation of the light world on Earth, and thus, by performing baptism, Mandaeans can directly connect with the light world while also purifying themselves of pollution. Though I should mention that some Mandaean communities are known to perform baptisms in pools as well, so there's a diversity of practice with this. I'll walk you through this video of a Mandaean baptism that was performed in Sydney, Australia in 2014. Everyone wears white ritual garments called Rasta. The man on the left is a high-ranking priest. The man being baptized is also a priest, but of a lower rank. There are three ranks of priests, the Tarmidas, the Gonzabras, and the Rishama, the leader of the people. That last rank is controversial, though. Some Mandaeans say that the office of Rishama is currently unfilled, while others claim one man or another is the Rishama. The priest dips his head in the water three times, then marks the forehead with a wet finger three times, then he drinks water from the priest's hand three times, though it's a bit difficult to see from this angle. Then a wreath of myrtle is placed under the turban, which was gathered ahead of time. Afterward, the Mandaeans share a ritual meal. The baptized members are anointed on the forehead with sesame oil, which is ritually prepared beforehand while reading prayers from the Ginza. Afterwards, they eat a piece of ritual bread and receive three servings of ritual water. The ritual ends with a clasping of hands called the kushta. Throughout the whole ceremony, the priest is constantly speaking. He is reciting prayers from the Mandaean canonical prayer book, and these prayers are basically a running commentary for the ritual. For example, as the priest enters the water, he recites a prayer that calls upon light world beings to guard their souls. 
During special occasions, there may be a drabsha planted on the shore, which is a ritual banner of white silk on a wooden cross-like pole with a crown of myrtle. This is considered by many as the symbol of the Mandaeans, and you can find depictions of the Drapsha on Mandaean websites and publications. Funerary rites involve a bunch of different rituals, but also includes ritual meals, baptism, anointing with oil, and crowning the person with myrtle. According to Mandaean cosmology, the goal for humans is to liberate the soul from the body and return it to its true home, the light world. So when a person dies, these funerary rites are performed to help the soul of the deceased to ascend to the light world. And in fact, this is what their funerary rites are called, the ascent. Like some other small indigenous religions in the region, like the Druze and the Yazidis, Mandaism is a closed or endogamous religion. That means members are born into it. If a Mandaean marries someone else from another religion, they and any children cease being Mandaean themselves, and you cannot convert into the religion. This, combined with natural disasters, persecution, and wars in their indigenous regions, has brought Mandaism to the brink of cultural extinction. In the 19th century, a cholera epidemic in southwestern Iran wiped out the entire priestly class and a local governor massacred Mandaeans in the 1870s, despite the Shah's opposition. Iran's Mandaeans lost their special status as people of the book when Ayatollah Khomeini took power in the Iranian Revolution in 1979, and they've been fighting to get it back to this day. The Iraq War of 2003 brought more dark times to the Mandaeans of that region, as they faced forced conversions, kidnappings, and killings. Most Mandaeans have since relocated to other countries, surviving in diaspora communities that number in a few hundred or a few thousand people. For example, most of the footage in this video is from a community near Sydney, Australia. In the interviews that I've watched, Mandaean priests often express concern for how they can better pass on their teachings to the younger generation, while still affirming the tradition that one must be born into the community. Some Mandaean religious leaders argue that Mandaean identity is more than a biological lineage, but a spiritual lineage that must be protected by keeping it as an endogamous community. If you'd like to learn more, I'm including a huge bibliography, and I recommend you watch the many videos produced by the team at the University of Exeter. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, hope you enjoyed that video. So a few weeks ago I offered a two-part online class called Magic in the Ancient World. It was basically, you know, 12 to 15 people in a Zoom room discussing ancient Roman magical practice. I had a lot of fun. I hope everybody that joined that class had fun too. I'm offering another class called Excavating the Bible. This is basically a four-part introduction to the archaeology of the biblical world. So who are the Canaanites? Who are the Philistines? Who are the ancient Israelites? Uh, basically examining the material data from the cultures mentioned in the Bible. But we're also going to cover archaeological methodology. So how do archaeologists interpret material culture? It's not always a battle between the text and the archaeological data, but I do feel like a lot of times that people do not let the material culture speak for itself. Um, so it's going to be four parts, one hour each between 12 to 15 people per class. I'm putting a link in the description below and in the comment section. I hope to see you there for Excavating the Bible. Thanks everyone.